you go. We're starting the story. And uh, for those who may have heard it or seen it, uh, it's based, as said, on this uh, book, uh, which is an abridged version of the NIV uh, Bible, basically telling the story and uh, the key events uh, through Scripture. So uh, we're going to be looking at that. The interesting thing is um, that as you read it, uh, often it's just like reading a novel. Um, because it's such a powerful story, and I encourage you uh, to uh, look at that in a moment. But uh, we read in in the fact that the Scripture tells us all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we believe here, particularly at Pearl Street and many other Christian churches, that the Bible is God's inspired word to us, Yes that basically this is God's way of communicating to us and everything's contained in the Bible is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking and training and drawing us closer to God. It's interesting that there's a lot of people in our community who don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe it and they say very clearly, I don't believe the Bible, don't believe that rubbish and everything. And the thing that's amazing all the time is just about 99.9% .9 of people who say that have never actually opened the Bible and read parts of the Bible. They've heard stories, they've heard people talk about it, but they've never actually read it themselves. So over the next um, few months, and I'll be saying months, uh, we're going to break over Christmas and that, uh, we're going to be looking from Genesis through to Revelation. We're going to be touch basing on, on the story um, and God's story to us. And as I said, if you want to play along at home and buy a book, copy of the book, you can. As I said, it's um, around about the, the $27 to $30 mark. However, I was able to find that there's a, um, a, an A4 bit of paper out there on the information desk that has all the different readings that we're going to be looking at. And uh, we're going to be putting them out on a regular basis. But if you want to grab that bit of paper instead of uh, maybe buying the book and going through it yourself, um, you can do that as well. So that resource is out there for you to look at as well. Um, it's called a verse map. And basically, it's got all the specific verses we're going to be looking at. You can also get an audio version of it if you like to, if you want to go down that path. Um, but really excited about sharing some of this material. Um, it's God's material. And it's God's story from Genesis to Revelation, putting it all in context, and the flow uh, is going to be amazing. So let's pray and let's get stuck into it. Well, Father God, again, we thank you that your word is alive, it's active, it's useful to teaching, correcting, rebuking, encouraging, and uh, Lord, drawing us closer to you. And Lord, I pray this morning as we begin this journey, as we begin this story, that Lord, you'd speak to us, that you'd encourage us, that you'd uplift us. And remind us that we are part of your story here on this earth. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. A little while back, um, a number of, number of uh, years back, I was um, walking um, down one of the main roads uh, in Adelaide and uh, there was this massive explosion. And uh, this building started catching on fire and there's stuff going everywhere. The emergency services started rocking up. And of course, there's a good bicycle sat back there and watched what was going on. I couldn't do anything. And uh, basically, the building is just going nuts. It's, it's, there's fire everywhere and explosions were going off and the police were starting to put um, barriers around because, you know, people were really worried about all that's going on. Next thing I noticed is a massive chunk of something came flying out and it landed just near where I was. And I, I went over and I picked it up. And as I picked it up, I thought, gee, this is all right. And it was a brand new iPhone. Who believes that story? <laughs> you know, the truth is an iPhone needs to be someone who's going to create it. They've got to actually design it, manufacture it. There's a lot of details that go into making a phone and the, the likelihood of an explosion and suddenly this thing landing at my feet and this being a perfectly good working phone, it might be someone's rec phone maybe, but not a perfectly working phone, uh, seems to be a bit crazy. But there are many people who believe that's the case. You see, in the beginning, there was God, as we've just heard from Scripture. And everything started with God. He was always there, always have been. And yes, the scientists are mucked up by this and they don't want to accept this. But the truth is God has always been there. And it's important to note that as we talk about the beginning of the world, beginning of humans, beginning of everything that we know, it's important to note that we've got to look at the main characters. Now, when you look at the, the beginning, the main characters often become Adam and Eve 
You know, they're the main character. That's not the main characters in the story. The main character in the story is God himself. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. In the beginning was God. And he's the main character. And the whole story is about him. It's his story, history, his story of what took place in the world. And uh, we've got to really be clear right from the start that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the interesting thing we go on to hear, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The spirit of God was hovering. And every good story obviously starts uh, at the beginning. And here is the beginning of how what we see around us started. And it's God's story to us showing us what happened and how things began. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to get caught up in the Big Bang Theory that we sort of reflect on here. But many people in our world today would say that that's the way that, that phone was created was like a Big Bang. And I personally want to declare to you today that I believe in the big, big, big Bang Theory. Totally believe the Big Bang Theory. I think it's great. God said, let there be light. Bang! And there was light. I believe in the Big Bang Theory, and I think we might need a paramedic in the building. It's all right. <laughs> the truth is, there would have been a bit of noise, maybe. I don't know, but there would have been a Big Bang. I believe totally that when God spoke, bang, it happened. And God is the one who made it. And see, God uh, was not a, uh, it didn't just happen by accident, and it wasn't just something that just appeared. The, the whole creation. Was, was done by a creative power of a personal God who created with purpose and order. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't just something that happened. It was planned detail to detail. In fact, scientists even know today that if you move the planets by just a small bit, it mucks everything up because God designed it how it's meant to be. And you and I have been part of that design as we just wouldn't believe that a phone just appeared out of a bang. Humanity just didn't appear out of bang. And I, and I, I personally want to reject the fact that, you know, well, I want to be careful I say this because some people would say we've come from apes and I think there's possibly some people who want to go down that path, but I just can't believe that, that that's how it happened. No, we've been created with purpose by a creative power who created the world with purpose and order. And the first chapter... Of, of the story, if you read the actual story, but the first chapter looking at the whole of Genesis tells us about this story, tells us about how we were created. And the fact that as we read uh, this uh, story and we read the start of the Bible, it's crucial that we actually get this first part of the story. If we miss the first part of this story, it's like we've walked in the middle of a movie missing the opening scene that sets the whole movie up for the end. And there's a lot of people who are living their life with missing the key part of the story, which is the start of it. So let's have a quick look as uh, it was read to us today. Um, and God said, let there be light. And bang, there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning for the first day. And I'm not going to get too caught up in the whole creation at the moment because we're going to keep moving forward. But the days one, two, and three were basically places and things that God created. He created the light and dark. He created sky and water. He created the land. And when he created all this, he said, it was good. It was good. He created it, and then he says, it was good. We read in verse 9 of Genesis and one, he says, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, let the dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and he gathered the waters, and he called them seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees of the land that bear fruit. With the seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetations, plants, bearing seeds according to their kinds and trees, bearing fruit with seed in accordance to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning for the third day. Those first three days, God just went nuts creating all the stuff that's in this world. 
And when he did, he said, it is good. Then he goes on in day four, we read that he he created the sun and the moons. And again, it was good. And it's interesting that, that God created the sun and the moon day four. Think about this. Our source of light is the sun and the moon. But John, first John, first John tells us, whoops, first John tells us that this is the message we've heard from Jesus and now declare to you God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So in those first few days as he's creating, there's still light because God is light. But then he created the uh, the sun and the moon and the stars. Day five, he created the birds and the sea creatures. And again, it was good. Day six, he created the animals as well, and he saw it was good. And obviously, he also created us. But after creating everything, he said it was good. But after creating all the animals and everything, there was something missing, and that's where he actually created humans. And it's really amazing as we read in Scripture because it says that we are the only creature ever that he created that has been created in the image and in the likeness of God. Let's read that again. First uh, Genesis chapter 126. God said, let us, us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, present right from the beginning, let us make man in our image, in the likeness, in our likeness, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground, so that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And again, it goes on to say, that it was good. You know, we're the only things that have been created in the likeness and in the image of God. No other animal, no other being on this planet has the same sort of soul like us that can make the choices that we can make, that have the freedom to live the way we have. There's nothing else. People might want to argue about that, but that's that's how it is. We're the only ones that have been created and we've been given the task of caring for the earth and everything in it. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Not just good, but it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. When he created the earth as we know it, he reflected upon it and the words were clearly, it was very good. On six days, he created the earth. The seventh day, he decided to have a rest, which let's not blame him. Hey, that would have been a lot of work. But the rest day was about setting a pattern for us. It wasn't actually about just him having a break. God didn't need the break. It was about us having an example of what we need to be doing in our life. Now, some debate over how many days it actually was and was it actually seven 24-hour days or you know, was it a, a year versus, you know, who knows? But I want to I wanted to let you know that after my uh, intensive theological study and reflection, I've got the answer. You ready for it? God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. There you go. Who cares if it was a 24-hour day or whatever? God created it. We don't know. But what we do know is he spoke and it happened. God created. And, folks, this is the key to the entire story. If you miss this opening chapter, you miss a whole lot of the foundation of what the Scripture is all about. You see, if you can understand that God spoke and bang, it happened, then God part, parting the Red Sea, that's no big deal. Or God shutting a lion's mouth so Daniel can survive, that's no big deal. Or even David, a young boy killing Goliath, that, that's nothing. And dare I even say that a virgin birth and Jesus who heals the sick and feeds 5,000 plus people, who raises from the dead, heals the blind, that's nothing compared to the creative power of our God. And if you miss this first part of the story, you can often miss the rest of what's going to happen. If you get the start of the story, then the rest of the story actually makes sense. God created us to be in relationship with him, just like Adam and Eve were walking in the garden with him together at the beginning. They were enjoying the blessings and the favour of God's creation There was no sickness. There was no hard work. Bring it on. Imagine that. Imagine just enjoying life. You know, most people like the idea of retirement so they can relax. Well, mate, this was 24-7 with God. And you know what's even, this this blows me away. And for those who know me, you know I hate the garden. There was no weeds. There was nothing to pull out of the garden. It was perfect. Oh, 
I, I hate mowing, let alone that. It was perfect. And the thing that was amazing is that Adam and Eve had this incredible intimate relationship with the Father. And we know that it didn't stay that way, though, because we read in Genesis chapter 3, there was a serpent more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree, any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you'll die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So at this point, they didn't know good and evil. They just knew God. And when and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, she also desired and, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. You know, Satan's strategy right from the beginning and continues to be is to question God's authority. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree? You know, there's actually one tree, but he makes it like, you know, you're allowed to have any of the trees. Twisting God's words and denying what God uh, was doing and saying and, and making us question his authority. We know that Satan is the, is the father of lies, and uh, for many people, he wants to pull us down and take us with him. You know, John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. That's the mandate of Satan. He wants to kill and steal and destroy. And we can blame Adam and Eve as much as we want, but let's be honest. This is not just their story. This is our story. Because we've all lied and been, we've always been lied and been manipulated by Satan ourselves, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Even though God has given us everything, as he gave Adam and Eve, we still choose to do things our way because we know best. <laughs> we still want more. We're not content just to have all the blessings and glory that God gives us. And just like Satan telling Eve that she'll be like God, in fact, Satan was the one who desired to be like God in the first place, not the other way around. But see, he continues to push temptations upon us to be more like God and be better and, and to have more than what we have. You know, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they broke that perfect relationship that God designed for us to be right from the beginning. They chose to disobey God. And as a result, everything changed. Everything was broken. We experienced separation and conflict, not only between God and humanity, but also conflict between each other. Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, who grew up knowing God, loving God. Man, they became so dysfunctional that we know that Cain wanted more, became so jealous, and as a result killed his own brother. Broken relationships, broken families, which leads to a broken and messed up world that we live in today. Because we've decided to do things our way, not God's way. Because we've decided to, to, to hear the lies of the enemy and think that we can be more like God on our own without him. You know, the interesting thing about this, this story, if you've read chapter 1, is we look at basically looks at the story of creation and then heads straight into the story of Noah. And it's interesting as we jump over into the times of Noah... Uh, what we know is that the world had populated and there was plenty of people in town and there's all sorts of theories about how many actual people were there. We, we don't know. Some suggest up to a million people were on the earth at the time. The truth is we really don't know. But what we know is that people's behaviour became so bad that God who created all things were grieved that he actually created mankind in his own image. As the creator who created us in his image, we were not displaying anything of God at that time. The world was so wicked and deprived that God's solution was to wipe us out completely. In Genesis 6, uh, we read these words, that God saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become 
and that every inclination of thoughts of his heart was only evil at the time. Just think about that. The Lord was grieved that he made man on this earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I'll wipe out mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth, men and animals and all creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I'm grieved that I've made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of God. And we know the story, for those who, who don't, maybe check out Genesis 6, where, where basically Noah and his sons built the ark and the animals came and, and God started again with Noah and his family who had a, a passion and a love for God. And you see, this story of God and Noah is played out over and over and over again. God's love for us and his love for creation goes to the point where he has done everything he can to make us continue to be walking with him, continue to be in relationship with him. And God gives us second chances. Even though the world was so wicked, God found the hope in, Adam, in, in Noah. And Noah was the one where he rebuilt and started again. God is a God that gives us the second chance. You know, maybe today you think, oh, gee, I've blown it. You know? I'm certainly not walking in the relationship that I should have with Jesus. I'm here in church or I'm watching online, but, gee, I know there's something missing in my life. Then I want you to hear that God's story is about him pursuing you and saying, I just want to be in relationship with you. It's not about how good or bad or ugly you are. It's about you acknowledging who I am and be prepared to walk with me in life. You know, when Adam and Eve discovered that um, they had sinned before God, when they'd taken the fruit, the first thing we read in Scripture is that they were ashamed, that they were guilty, and they felt unworthy of God's presence. And what they did is they realised they were naked and they started covering themselves up. And the truth is when we actually go against God's plans and we actually go down a path of sin, we can feel the same. There can be a sense of shame and a sense of, of guilt and a sense of nakedness. Now, I want you to hear what it is that God did to his children that he created. Genesis chapter 3, we read these words. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. This is Adam and Eve. And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord of God among the trees of the garden. So here's the scenario. Suddenly they've felt shame and guilt for the first time because of their sin. God is walking in the garden amongst them and instead of going and hanging out with God, they are now hiding from God. Does it sound familiar? The truth is we deal with this. How dare can God be in my presence because of what I've done? But I want you to hear what it is that God does for his children. But the Lord God called, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I've commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree that I ate it. You know, and we're still been fighting throughout the whole time, haven't we? It's her fault, my fault, her fault. The truth is, it's all of our fault. Ashamed and naked and guilty of blame. And yet here's God dealing with the rebellion. You know, life's not going to no longer be perfect. It's not going to be easy as I designed it to be. There's going to be consequences around this. But it says then the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Think about this. God killed an animal that he created so that he could have garments for Adam and Eve. This is the first death we see in Scripture a sacrifice of an animal to cover up the sin of Adam and Eve. An innocent animal, blood shed so that their shame and nakedness can be covered. You see, right from the beginning of time, God has continued to make sacrifices for the people that he's created because he loves us so much. And it's not going to be the only time that blood would be shed to cover the sins of humanity. And as we look throughout the entire story 
This idea of sacrifice and, and repentance continues to be played through ultimately into the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. In the book of Romans we read, yes, Adam, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. That's you and me because of Adam's sin. But because one other person obeyed God, that's Jesus, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, this is the upper story of the entire story that we're going to look at. And this is going to be a constant theme through the entire Bible of God loving us and doing all that he can to keep us in relationship with him. And the other part of the story of the upper story that continues on is us continuing rebelling against the Father because we think we know better. In the beginning, the earth was a dark, empty blob. God spoke and created the entire world. Light, sky, fish, birds, and animals. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image, and created man out of dirt. And the man became a human being named Adam. And after six days of work, God took a rest. God then put Adam in a garden where there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from it, you will die. Eventually, God caused the man to fall asleep, took out one of his ribs and created a woman who Adam Whoa. named Eve. God joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. Later, a serpent came and convinced Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying they would become like God if they did. Eve took a bite, and then so did Adam. Because of this choice, God cursed the serpent as well as Adam and Eve and forced them out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Outside the garden, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. When they made sacrifices, God accepted Abel's sacrifices of animals, but not Cain's sacrifice of crops. This made Cain so angry that he murdered Abel. People began to populate the entire earth, and wickedness and tragedy continued to spread. God regretted ever making human beings and decided to wipe them from the face of the earth. But God found one man, Noah, who walked faithfully. So God instructed Noah to build a giant boat called an ark and to take his entire family along with a male and female of every kind of animal onto the boat. For 40 days it rained and the entire earth was flooded, wiping out every living thing, plants, animals, and humans, all of it destroyed. Eventually, the flood stopped and the ark came to rest on dry land. Noah and his family came out of the ark, and God made a promise that the entire earth would never again be completely flooded. God put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of this promise, and God looked for someone to bless the entire world. So that's uh, chapter one, scene one, act one. And... The whole of what we're going to be looking at in these coming uh, weeks and months is God's story of how much he loves us, desires to be in relationship with us, and that we'd be walking in relationship with him. And I want to suggest this morning that maybe you feel that you failed or you're let down or you're nowhere living in that relationship with Jesus. Well, this journey is going to be about reminding you that God loves you, that he actually did all of this for you and I that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's an exciting story. It's a powerful story. And the questions I continue to ask is, where are you in the story? Are you accepting that God is the creator, that he's the giver of life, 
that he sent his son, Jesus, or is this something new to you? And I want to suggest as we journey through this series that you'll be drawn closer to God as we understand his big story and the big picture of what's contained in the Bible. Let me pray. Father God, I want to thank you for the, the, the Bible and, Lord God, for all the stories that are contained within that remind us that you're for us and not against us, which reminds us that there's consequence to our sin and our actions. But, Lord, it also reminds us that you sent your son Jesus to die and to pay the ultimate price and to be the ultimate sacrifice to cover our sins and our wrongdoing. And, Lord, I pray for everyone who's here this morning and those on the phone and computer, that, Lord, wherever we sit in our relationship with you, that you would draw us closer to you and that, Lord God, that we'd be acknowledging you in all of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.